Let's just pray together, shall we? Father, it's so lovely to be reminded at the beginning of this Bible study that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We thank you, Father, that from where you sit, nations have come and nations have gone, and empires have risen and empires have crumbled, but you're the same. And we thank you, Father, because we are living in a very temporary time. We know, Father, that the day is coming when you will establish your kingdom on the earth, and that kingdom shall be from everlasting to everlasting. Hallelujah. And Father, we just thank you because Jesus is coming back as the mighty king, as the great conqueror, as the one who will provide the salvation for our souls. And we say to you, even tonight, Father, that as we see the uh, affairs going on in the world around us, and we see kingdoms falling, and we see kingdoms rising, we can sit in confidence because we know that you are the Lord of history and you're above it all. Praise God. And Father, tonight we just ask, Father, that the message that may come forth is that it doesn't matter whose side anyone's on, as long as they're on God's side. Hallelujah. And Father, we t today set ourselves aside just for your purpose. And Father, we say, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Father, we know any group of people who are blessed by God shall live forever, hallelujah, shall last forever. And Father, in this temporary time, we just want, Father, to remind our hearts again that it's only being a Christian that can give uh, a person security in this present world. Father, we just ask you to take the words that are spoken tonight and to use them as you see fit to use them. And Father, may we all be edified, may we all be blessed tonight in Jesus' name. And may we get really excited by the things that we study together. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise God. Tonight we're coming on to the subject of Babylon and the subject specifically of the fall of Babylon. Now, any person who is a serious Bible student will sooner or later hit up against the subject of Babylon. You can't really go very far in, in Bible study without finding that you are confronted either with the name Babylon or with the group of people who are the Babylonians. And uh, you'll find actually in the Bible that there is more written about Babylon, about the Babylonians, about the Chaldeans, and I'll explain the terms in just a moment, there's more written about them than any other group of people except, of course, the Jews, Israel, and Jerusalem. In fact, about one in four books of the Bible deal with um, Babylon in some part of, of their content. And some books are almost entirely devoted to the subject of uh, Babylon. Jeremiah, I think, is the best book. Every other chapter deals with Babylon when you come to the book of Jeremiah. And if you're going to understand the book of Jeremiah, and it's a very large book, and if you're going to understand some of these major books of the Old Testament, you've got to know something about Babylon. So although I'm talking about the fall of Babylon specifically tonight, I'm going to use tonight as the opportunity to give a resume of something of the history uh, connected with Babylon. It's very short. I don't mean the talk is very short, but I mean the history is very short, but it's very exciting history. Uh, to, just to put it into context, the area we are dealing with is an area of the Middle East, and it's the area north of the top of the Persian Gulf, or the Arabian Gulf, as it is now called. The country that occupies this area today is the country of Iraq, R-I-R-A-Q, the country of Iraq. All right, and there are two major rivers which run through this area, and these two rivers have given the area a general name, the name of Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is simply a Greek way of saying between the two rivers. And the two rivers concerned are the river Tigris, T-I-G-R-I-S, and the river Euphrates, which most of you can spell, I hope, E U P H. R-A-T-E-S, all right? The two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. The Tigris runs southwards down into the top of the Persian Gulf, and to the south, south and to the west of it, the Euphrates flows. And you'll find that the Euphrates and the Tigris join together just before they enter into the Persian Gulf. Now, that's the area we are talking about, all right? 
And Babylon is actually itself built on the river Euphrates. Built on the river Euphrates, just a few miles upstream from where it joins the river Tigris. All right? So there it is. Present day Iraq is the area called Mesopotamia. And you know, it, it's very interesting. This is probably the area which has been settled longer than any other area on the face of the planet. When Noah actually came out of the ark, he landed up in the, in the mountains between Turkey and Russia, somewhere up to the north here. And as soon as the ark was opened, uh, the eight men who were on board, sorry, the eight families, I was, the eight in, in the families, that's four men and four women, uh, came out of the ark and they started spreading down into the lowlands. When they came out of the ark, they moved south because it was warmer in the south. They soon hit the river Euphrates and the river Tigris and they started moving down and they occupied the area of Mesopotamia. They didn't call it Mesopotamia, they called it the land of Shinar. S-H-I-N-A-R. Shinar, not China. All right? Worlds of difference between those. Shinar. And if in the Bible you see the word Shinar, that's a simply another name for Babylon. All right? Um, one of the fellows who traveled down, one of the sons of Ham, uh, he, his name was Nimrod. And it says in Genesis 10 that Nimrod, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and he established the city called Babel. B-A-B-E-L. Would you turn with me to Genesis chapter 10? Let's just have a quick look at that to see how old this area is. Genesis chapter 10, and we come to verse 6 where we get the sons of Ham. All right, Genesis chapter 10 and verse 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, and Put, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush, Seba, Havala, Sabta, Rama, Sab Sabteka, and the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush began Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and it names some others, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. And Babel then was the first city to be established on the face of the earth. And this is the subject of tonight's talk. This city called Babel, later on called Babylon. Now, before I go any further, could I explain just two terms so that everyone understands two terms? You'll find that the Babylonians are called by two names. First of all, obviously, Babylonians. Right? B-A-B-Y-L-O-N-I-A-N-S. But the other name for them is the Chaldeans. C-H-A-L-D-E-A-N-S. Or the Chaldeans. I don't mind which of those you actually use. The Babylonians and the Chaldeans. Now, to us today, we use them interchangeably. The situation is rather like the situation in Wales today. In Wales today, you have a people who've lived there for quite some time, and they call themselves Welsh. But actually, they're composed of two different types of people. You've got the Celts, who were the originals, and you've got those who came over from England and uh, peopled the area. And Cardiff isn't the only area to have English Welshmen living there. But they both call themselves Welsh. And the situation in Babylon was this. You had two types of people, Babylonians, and you had Chaldeans or Chaldeans, and these two called themselves or treated themselves as one people. Basically, there is a slight difference. Let me just show you what the difference is. If you go from the river Euphrates to the south, that's the area called Chaldea. So Chaldea was to the south of the river Euphrates and north of Arabia. Babylon was the area between the rivers. All right? So when they first began, the Chaldeans lived on fairly dry land. The Babylonians were very dark people, and they dwelt in the swamps and the marshes which existed between the Euphrates and the river Tigris. Now, that's the simple arrangement. It's a bit more complicated than that. I've talked about the Welsh. I suppose I ought to mention the Scots. In Scotland today, you have a system of clans. 
uh, everyone belongs to a certain type of clan. I've forgotten how many there are, but there are loads. I knew a lady once who was an ancient gun, and she was very proud of being an ancient gun. I could almost say boom, boom at that point. <laughs> but uh, you've got the McLeods, you've got the Campbells, and some of these clans, especially to the Campbells, some of these clans don't speak to one another. And the situation among the Babylonians was exactly the same. They didn't have a huge number of uh, clans. They had just five clans. They didn't call them clans. Their names uh, for a clan was a bit, a B-I-T, bit. And you would say to a Babylonian, oh, which bit do you belong to? (laughs) And he would say, oh, I'm a member of bit Shalani, or I'm a member of bit Yakin, or one of the other bits. And every Chaldean and every Babylonian knew which bit they actually were a member of. All right? So we use the terms totally interchangeably. We have no problems over that. So when you see the word Chaldean, it means a Babylonian. When you see the word Babylonian, it means a Chaldean. There's a very minor difference only between the two. All right, now they're in five bits. And the problem, as far as the Babylonians were concerned, was this. That these five bits, or these five clans, would never agree with one another. They were so standoffish that they'd never get together and do anything. So that, for example, when one bit of the Babylonians would say, hey, wouldn't it be great if we had a Babylonian empire? The other bits would say, what? And with you as the ruler, never. And there'd be problems, there'd be arguments uh, among the ranks of the Babylonians. Then all of a sudden, a few years later, another of the bits would come up and say, wouldn't it be great if we had a Babylonian empire? And for centuries, the Babylonian bits were all coming up one after the other saying, wouldn't it be super to have an empire? And all the others were shaking their heads saying, no, not at all. And for that reason, for years, century after century, the Babylonians were a very minor, meaningless people. In fact, they were so meaningless that they were just one of the ordinary uh, states that belonged to the great kingdom of Assyria. Assyria was to the north, and this great kingdom of Assyria, which began at the time of Jonah, do you remember the tape I did on Jonah, where... Uh, the whole of the Assyrians repented before God. And because they repented before God, God started blessing the Assyrians. And the Assyrians became believers, and immediately God's blessing spread, and their empire and kingdom started spreading. And one of the groups of people they took over were the Babylonians down here to the south. To tell you the honest truth, the Assyrians didn't like the Babylonians much. The Assyrians were used to fairly solid ground. They viewed the Babylonians just as swamp dwellers down to the south. And occasionally the Babylonians would rise against the Assyrians. And as soon as the Assyrian army turned up, they simply turned on their heel and ran back to the swamps. And there they would dwell. All right? Now that's the type of situation. And it's obvious, therefore, isn't it, that if that is the situation, it's going to need a man of great genius to start bringing these tribes together. And so it is in uh, about uh, the 7th century BC that we find that at last the type of caliber of man needed to bring the bits together starts emerging. And I've taken one chap just to demonstrate the type of man who came out, a man with an odd name, odd to us, but he's mentioned actually in the Bible just very quickly. We'll see him in a moment. Uh, A man called Merodach Baladon. Merodach Baladan. That's it. M-E-R-O-D-A-C-H hyphen. Nice having a hyphenated name, and he had one. B-A-L-A-D-A-N. Merodach Baladan. And he was a Chaldean prince. And one day he got so sick of the Assyrians that he decided it was time the Babylonians got together, kicked the Assyrians out, and really started fighting for themselves. And unlike the other attempts at it, Merodach Baladan actually succeeded in bringing the bits together. Mind you, he was helped slightly. He was helped in this way. The king of Assyria at the time was this man called Sargon, S-A-R-G-O-N. And Sargon, in 721 BC, was rather busy further north. I hope most of you here know what Sargon was doing in 721 BC. God had finally decided he'd had enough of the northern kingdom of Israel. And so he thought, right, I've had enough of them. 
Sargon, the great king, is going to come in and he's going to take them over. And in 721, Sargon was besieging Samaria and the northern kingdom was, was uh, being beaten up by Sargon's armies. And way down in the swampland of Babylon, Merodak Baladan looked out from the rushes and he said, hey, the Assyrians seem to be occupied elsewhere. I think now's the time. He got all the people together and when he looked at the five bits that he got together of the Babylonians, he thought, well, heavens, we'll never do anything with this lot. What we need are some people who can fight. So he went next door to another group of people called the Elamites and they could fight. And he decided that it was time they were going to take Babylon. To show you what awful fighters the Babylonians were at that time, the Elamites arrived outside Babylon ready for the battle. And Merodach Baladan was late. <laughs> and the Elamites started fighting the Assyrians, and guess what? They won. And when Merodach Baladan arrived with his army, Babylon had already fallen to the Elamites. And the Elamites, I think, must have been out of their head. They said, oh, we've won the battle, by the way. Here's Babylon. And for the first time, the Babylonians marched into Babylon, took over the city, and Merodak Baladon was king of Babylon for the first time. Sargon wasn't bothered much, you know, the swamplands were simply areas where you tended to catch swamp fever and other things. And so he, uh, first of all, finished his campaigns up north. And then he decided, at, uh, it was about uh, 710 BC, that it was time he taught this Merodak Baladan a lesson. And so the Assyrian army came down and Babylon fell. Merodach Baladan was kicked out and Sargon said, now listen, Merodach Baladan, if you're a good boy for the rest of my life, I won't touch you. And Merodach Baladan said, yes, sir. And off he went to Jordia, where he lived a very nice life. But can you see, the Babylonians at that time have realized that if they'd only get together, they could actually start forming a force to be reckoned with. I will just go over the bit that mentions Merodach Baladon in the Bible. He's mentioned in two passages, two kings, I've forgotten the, the chapter, two kings right at the end, and in Isaiah 39. So would you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 39, <clears throat> Isaiah 39, where we've got him mentioned. The date of Isaiah 39 is, seven, is, is uh, between 710 and 703 B.C. Sargon, the king of Assyria, died. And so all of a sudden, Merodach Baladon said, well, I've been a good boy while uh, Sargon's been alive, uh, alive. And so now I think I'm going to walk back into Babylon again. And Sennacherib, who was now king of Assyria, thought, oh, are you? And he moved some troops up to protect Babylon. So Merodach, Merodach Baladon decided he needs some friendly help. He went back to the Elamites and they said, what, after last time? You must be joking. And so Merodach Baladon thought, well, I've got to get some help from somewhere. And so he sent envoys all over the Middle East world. And one of them went to visit our old friend, King Hezekiah. And this is the story of what happened when Merodach Baladon visited Hezekiah. Hezekiah was under judgment at this particular point. Judah had turned their back on God and they were in the fourth cycle of discipline. If you don't know what that means, listen to the tape on the five cycles of discipline. And all of a sudden, this Babylonian envoy arrives from Merodach Baladan, and Hezekiah ushers them in. He says, come in. Let's read the story. Isaiah 39. At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he'd been sick and was recovered. It's flattery, isn't it? You know? Well, fancy you're knowing that I've been sick. That's very kind of you. Oh, yes, well, we've come all the way just to give you a present. And by the way, while we're here, how strong are you? <laughs> That's the, the type of idea. Verse 2, Hezekiah was glad of them and showed them the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. It's very good, isn't it, eh? You open up your full arsenal to the enemy and you say, oh, look what I've got. And they take a good look round, making notes as they go. They're going back to Merodach Baladon saying, oh, yes, Judah will help you. Fortunately, Hezekiah has a man, a spiritual man, who's going to give him some advice, a man called Isaiah. And in this passage, you see Isaiah really angry. And I mean really angry. 
because he thought that Hezekiah was going to try and reverse God's judgment on him by forming an alliance with a Richard Babylonian. So he marches in and says, oh, verse 3, Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah. Hezekiah must have said, oh, no, look what's walked in. <laughs> Trouble, <laughs> this is it. And he said to him, uh, what said these men? I've seen some men coming away. What did they want? And from whence came they unto thee? Hezekiah said, they're come from a far country unto me, even from Babylon, swanking slightly, swaying on his feet. Then said he, what have they seen in thy, thine house? And Hezekiah answered, all that is in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and all which is in thy father's have, uh, and all which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. You like Babylon right. Your children are going to live there. That's what he said. And nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons which shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And this amazing judgment upon Hezekiah, Isaiah says, oh, by the way, the fifth cycle is coming, and your children are going to be taken away into Babylon. And you know Hezekiah's reaction, selfish to the, to the last. He says, Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. He said, Moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in my days. That's selfish, you see. Oh, well, that's marvellous. So I'm going to be all right. I don't care what happens to my children and grandchildren, as long as I'm all right. That's what he says. All right? And so there we are. That's the mention of Merodach Baladan. Actually, by the way, he did revolt against Sennacherib in 703, and Sennacherib, Sennacherib beat him hollow. And that was the end of the Babylonians then for about another, another 80 years. And it's when we come to the end of the 80 years, when we come down to about the time of 612 BC, that, that the Babylonians start coming into their own and start becoming the great nation that they were. For about this time, and the few years before this time, Assyria was on its last legs. It had been around for a very long time, hundreds of years, and now it was having trouble controlling all of its outlying districts. And the king, who was later to commit suicide, by the way, the king of Assyria thought, well, I'm having trouble with Babylon. So I know what I'll do, he said. I've got a general who is a Chaldean. What I'll do is this. He's a good chap. I like him. I'll send him down to Babylon, and he can go down and he convince them that I'm a very good king, and wouldn't it be nice uh, to remain allied to me? And so he sent his general, who was a man called Nabopolassa. I'm sorry about these names, but I'm going to put them up. You can write them down and learn them. N A B O. P-O-L-A-S-S-A-R, Nabopolassa. He's the father of a very famous man, who I'll come on to in just a minute. And Nabopolassa said, certainly, sir, I'll go down to Babylon as your general. As soon as he got down to, to Babylon, he thought, hey, Assyria's on its last legs. I think this might be a good time now to come along and uh, to fight against Assyria and let's see if we can defeat Syria. He went down south, he told everyone that he was a Chaldean, and he said, what about joining behind me? And then we can have a great Babylonian empire. And all the people thought, great. Merodach Baladan did it, nearly succeeded. We might succeed this time. And so he sent letters up to the Scythians, who were the Russians, up to the Medes, and he said, if you'll attack north, we'll attack south, and we'll finish Assyria off. And they said, done. And the, the cavalry the chariots and all the other things were sent into the battle. And by the year 612 BC, Assyria had finally finished. There was a huge bonfire. Uh, the whole of the empire went up in smoke in 612. And Nabopolassar then became king of Babylon. King of Babylon. And it's actually from about 612 that the history of Babylon really begins. Of course, most people have never heard of Nabopolassar. His son is much more famous, and it's his son that we deal with when we're talking about the city of Babylon. Um, he reigned, Nabopolassar reigned for about five years, and then died, quite a, a, a premature death. And his son, who was out battling at the time, rushed back. 
to Babylon to take the city. The son's name was our old friend Nebuchadnezzar. Now we're on easy ground, I hope, after all that. Nebuchadnezzar. N-E-B-U-C-H-A-D-N-E-Z-Z-A-R. Nebuchadnezzar. And this man was a genius. He was a genius in many, many fields of his life. His father was a wise man. Do you know, he'd sent Nebuchadnezzar out uh, on a building site when he was younger. And when he was out at m- mixing the pug and all the other things on the building site, that's a name for concrete, I understand. And uh, he was mixing these things. And during that time, he learnt a huge amount about the building trade. And when he came to the throne, we had on the throne of Babylon a man who was a military genius, a man who was a political genius, and a man who was an architectural genius. And in 607, 606, that type of period, he became the great king of Babylon. And it is to him that you actually um, have to look when you're talking about the actual city of Babylon itself. Um, the city of Babylon was magnificent. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was, uh, applied his full talents and his full genius to the city as far as uh, the city was concerned. All right? Could we just turn to Jeremiah 27? Jeremiah 27. And we'll see Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> All right? And here is a prophecy about Nebuchadnezzar and about the Jews that Jeremiah gave. God says about Nebuchadnezzar that he had raised them up. And the Jews were gradually, living in Judea, were gradually getting more and more out of fellowship as far as God was concerned. And it was going to be Nebuchadnezzar who was going to act as God's minister, God's servant, to bring judgment down on the head of the Jews. We know later on, by the way, that he became a believer. He was so impressed with Daniel, so impressed with the three children that he threw into the furnace, that he actually became a believer. And Daniel 4 is the first tract, Christian tract, that's ever been written. Written by Nebuchadnezzar to tell everyone about his conversion. And do read it sometime if you want really thrilling reading of how an idolater and a man who served and worshipped the god Ishtar and Marduk and all the other gods suddenly found that there was only one god, the Lord of Heaven is his name. Hallelujah. And he that had laid out the heavens and the earth was the name of his God. Praise God. So this is our brother who we will meet one day when we get to heaven, Nebuchadnezzar. All right, I introduce you to him if uh, you've never heard me speak on Nebuchadnezzar before. And notice what it says, verse 4, and this is it, and command them to say unto their, their masters, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Thus shall you say unto your masters, I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are upon the ground, by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and have given it unto whom it seemed meet unto me. And now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And the beasts of the field have I given him also to serve him. And all nations shall serve him, and his son, and his son's sons, until the very time of his land come. And then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him." And it shall come to pass that the nation and the kingdom which shall not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and that will not put their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation will I punish, saith the Lord, with the sword and with the famine, with the pestilence, until I've consumed them by his hand. In other words, God was behind Nebuchadnezzar in all the work that Nebuchadnezzar was going to do. Let me uh, describe Babylon to you, because this is the city that fell so dramatically, and if you'll excuse the phrase, without a shot being fired. Nebuchadnezzar, this great city, collapsed without one of the uh, men fighting against it, dying in the field, or even having to lift his sword. Let's have a look at the city and how wonderful it was. First of all, it was built on a river, the river Euphrates, and Nebuchadnezzar viewed that as a great challenge. Uh, Here's the river Euphrates. Let me draw it in approximately. You'll recognize it instantly, of course. (laughs) There it is. And he built um, Babylon as a square. Look how big it was. It was a square, half of which was on one side of the Euphrates, half of which was on the other side of the Euphrates. The four walls were 14 miles long on all sides. 14 miles long. 
So it was a square of 14 by 14 miles. This is a city of the ancient world 2,500 years ago. Amazing. Uh, so the total circumference was 56 miles and the area was 196 square miles. You can check that afterwards. All right, I've worked it out before. Uh, the river ran right through the center. Here it was. All the way around it, because Nebuchadnezzar was a military genius, all the way around it, he built a moat. All the way around, 56 miles of moat. And the moat was 30 feet deep. All the way around the city. Quite an achievement that. More than that, he built two walls, and in some places, three walls, all the way around the city. So here's the outer wall, here's the next wall, built a double wall. And not just a little wall, like we saw in Tyre last time, which was 150 feet tall. This were, both of these walls were well over 300 feet tall. It's like standing at the bottom of... Uh, the, the cathedral in Chichester, and looking up to the top of the spire and then doubling that height. And that is how high the wall was uh, around Babylon. Can you imagine? The army would march up to that and look up like this, and they must have thought, we can never do it. It was a solid drop right the way down, over 300 feet tall. The walls were also 100 feet wide, both of them. All right? Now, that was pretty good defense, wasn't it? You broke through one, you still had another one to deal with. <laughs> All around the uh, outside then, there were um, about <clears throat> 100 gates all the way around. All right? Marvelous gates. And they were made out of bronze with iron bars going behind them. And no one in the ancient world could knock those gates down. Nebuchadnezzar had designed them. He'd had skill. He'd had experience. Uh, as far as siege was concerned, not one person could knock one of those gates down. And they were beautiful gates, too, very beautiful. The greatest of the gates was the famous Ishtar, I-S-H-T-A-R, the famous Ishtar gate, and it was the one that Nebuchadnezzar always used. They were marvelous. The gates themselves were built out of bricks, not just ordinary bricks, but um, wonderful bricks. What they had more or less done was this. They'd taken an area of clay and they'd sculptured in the wet clay a horse or a lion or a bull or something like that. And then they'd split up the area of clay into bricks, fired them, and put colored enamel on the outside, purple and green and yellow and beautiful colors like that. So that finally you ended up with a wall built out of brick with the relief of a horse coming out of the bricks. Most beautiful. And they're still around today. The British Museum has one. And you can actually see it. The colors are still there 2,500 years later. And the whole of the Ishtar Gate has been preserved in a museum in Berlin. The Germans were the one who excavated this area. I will put at the back uh, three postcards that I've got showing the type of walls that they built. And you can see very clearly that the animals come out in relief in the most beautiful colors. Um, there's one that uh, is just ordinary brown, but there is a rather beautiful wall showing all the purples and the yellow and green and all the other things. Now that's what most of the walls were built of. Nebuchadnezzar had done that. He was a, he was a genius. All right? Uh, then around the walls you also had 250 watchtowers all the way around. And these were 100 feet taller than the walls. Now we're talking about probably the most defended city of the ancient world. It was impregnable. Very clever. This was Nebuchadnezzar. He'd also designed the city so that there was enough farmland inside the city walls to feed the population. And he also, just in case that wasn't enough, he had 20 years provision, just in case some army had surrounded them for 20 years. And so the result was, when an army came and sieged, uh, put this city to siege, they could just play cards inside. They could just put their feet up and enjoy themselves. No one was going to get in. The great problem, of course, as is obvious, uh, from this diagram, is the river. The river split the city into two sections. And it also passed under the walls. And here Nebuchadnezzar uh, showed what a genius he was. First of all, he built a bridge over the river, 660 feet long. And in case that wasn't enough, he also drilled a tunnel underneath the river. So that you could uh, take your choice, either the Millwall Tunnel or over Tower Bridge, all right, of, of Babylon. All right, so that was the, the first thing. But it was where the river passed under the walls 
that we had the major problem, where he had the major problem. And the river was flowing from the north to the south. So he invented two gates, which were made out of bronze, which interlocked like a valve. And these were amazing because the pressure of the water caused them to close more tightly against one another. So that actually, while the river was flowing, absolutely no one could move the gates. No one at all could open those gates. And they were locked tight against one another. Well, that was the city of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar lived inside of that city, and they felt they were as safe as houses. And so it seemed they were. All right? And it's this city that God starts talking about. He, of course, doesn't see it as an impregnable city. He sees it from his point of view. Just a little city built on a river. So he starts talking about it. So let's have a look at some prophecies uh, relating to Babylon. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13. And uh, the trouble is there are so many passages that actually deal... Um, with Babylon, I've had to pick and choose the prophecies. So I will, we'll go to two other passages, and let's write up the prophecies that I'm going to take. All right? I'm going to take eight prophecies related to Babylon, and then we'll see how they were fulfilled. So we'll begin with Isaiah 13, and in verse 1, can you see it's about Babylon? The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. And I'm going to begin in verse 17 where we have the first. Number one, I will stir up the Medes. Medes, so the first prophecy is, the Medes will come against Babylon. The Medes and the Persians were two neighbors, and they fought together. So there's the first thing. And this is a hundred years, by the way, before Nebuchadnezzar came to the throne. God says, oh, by the way, the Medes are going to mark the end of Babylon. That's number one. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall delight in it, shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children, and Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, will be, uh, um, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah which was a city, two cities, of course, which were totally destroyed. So number two, Babylon will be destroyed. At the time it was written, and up to the time that it actually fell, no one could imagine ever that Babylon could be destroyed by the Medes or anyone else. Uh, verse 20, it shall never be inhabited. Number three, then, found in verse 20, never inhabited again. Amazing. You see, Babylon was a beautiful city. If you knocked down Babylon, you would obviously live there and rebuild it. Do you know that although it was built on the plain, uh, Nebuchadnezzar so loved his wife, who loved mountains, that he built a mountain inside Babylon for her. He, he, she was used to walking on the mountaintops, so he decided he'd build one. And they became one of the seven wonders of the world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. They were built by Nebuchadnezzar for his wife. That's real love, isn't it? I don't have room, Roz. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Good. Uh, verse 20, It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. So number four, no Arabs or nomads will live there. That's the next one. Number five, wild animals will live there. Number five, wild animals are going to live there. And here it is, uh, verse 21. You've got to interpret this in the uh, King James Version. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. That's the jackal. Ooh... Terrible noise that the jackal makes, all right? Um, full of doleful creatures, their jackals, and owls shall, dance, shall dwell there, and satyrs or satyrs shall dance there. The, the satyr there is a wild goat. He's going to live there. Not a man, not a king. A wild goat is going to dwell there. 
Verse 22, the wild beasts of the islands, they're hyenas, hyenas, shall cry in their desolate houses, and dragons, no, not dragons, jackals again, and jackals in their pleasant palaces, and her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. In other words, the remains of the palaces are going to be occupied by jackals and hyenas and wild goats and things like that, and not by people. If you go then to Isaiah 14 and verse 23, we get our sixth prophecy. I will also make it a possession of the bittern and pools of water. Number six, water will flood it. That's the next one from verse um, 23 there, all right? And I love the next bit, and I will sweep it with the besom of destruction, saith the Lord. In other words, to him, Babylon, well, he'll sweep it up like the dead leaves. That's all God will do, all right? And then if you go then to Jeremiah 51, Jeremiah 51 And we'll take just two others. Verse 26, and here's our seventh. Jeremiah 51, verse 26. They shall not take of thee a stone for a corner, nor a stone for foundations. Thou shalt be desolate forevermore. Seven, no stones removed. Not the bricks it's talking about. It's talking about the foundation stones. No stones removed. And in verse 43 of Jeremiah 51, the next one, Her cities are a desolation, a dry land and a wilderness, a land wherein no man dwelleth, neither doth any son of man pass thereby. Eight, few visitors. And they're the eight prophecies that I'm going to take. All right? Few visitors. Fine. <clears throat> In uh, two other passages, we get a little uh, idea of what actually is going to happen. How is such a tremendous city as Babylon going to fall and become as nothing as these prophecies actually say? So, turn back with me to Isaiah. We're darting around in the Bible quite a bit. Turn back with me to Isaiah, and we get the name of the man who's going to do it. Here he is, Isaiah 45 and verse 1. <clears throat> Isaiah 45 and verse 1. About 180, 200 years before he came, God knew his very name. Verse 1, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two-leaved gate, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. In other words, he says, when you come to Babylon, do you know what's going to happen? The gates will fly open in front of you. That's what he's actually prophesying here. And in verse 1, where you get the mention of the two-leaved gates, that is the gate through which the Euphrates passed. The gates had a grill on the front of them, and the pressure pushed the gates shut. All other gates could be opened. That one could not be opened. And God says, oh, by the way, Cyrus, you can take Babylon. Do you know how you can do it? You're going through the gate that no man can open because I'm going to open the gate in front of you. That's actually what he says. Fine. Let's see then, shall we, the destruction <clears throat> of the city of Babylon. And let's understand how it came to pass. For it, it's an amazing story. We've got... Just to go back to, to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, first of all, and let's understand about Nebuchadnezzar, and then we'll go to his grandson, during whose reign Babylon actually fell. If we've got Nebuchadnezzar, I've put him as an N up here. <clears throat> he had many children. I'm going to take three of them. Three of them. First of all, he had a son. The son was called Amel Marduk. A-M-E-L-M-A-R-D-U-K. He then had a daughter, and then he had another daughter. I'm going to put them up there. Now, M. Amel Marduk is mentioned in the Bible. He's the evil Merodach mentioned in the Bible. And the only thing we know about him was that he liked Jehoiachin. 
and it says, oh, he treated him nicely. And that's it. The Bible says no more about him. He wasn't a very good king. He reigned for two years, and after two years' reign, his brother-in-law, who was married to Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, a man called Neri Glissa, N-E-R-I-G-L-I-S-S-A-R, he thought, well, honestly, I don't think much of my brother-in-law. I think I'd rather reign. So all he does, he assassinates Amel Marduk, kills him off, and he takes the throne. So now you've had Nebuchadnezzar, his son Amel Marduk, and now his son-in-law takes the throne. They're at Neri Glissa. Uh, he dies fairly rapidly, and then his son, who's Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, you think about this afterwards, then takes the throne. A man called Labashi Marduk. L-A-B-A-S-H-I, Labashi Marduk, M-A-R-D-U-K. He was even worse than his uncle had been, Amel Marduk. And he reigned for two months. <laughs> and in the third month, his uncle, married to the, the second daughter of Nebuchadnezzar, he says, honestly, this wretched chap, my nephew reigning, I think I should be king. And so he rises up and he kills Labashi Marduk. It's a bit complicated, isn't it? And this man, whose name was Nabonidus, N-A-B-O-N-I-D-U-S, finally comes to the throne. All right? So we've got Nebuchadnezzar's son-in-law now reigning over Babylon. So that's Nebuchadnezzar, Amal Marduk for two years, Neriglissa, Labashi Marduk, now Nabonidus. And here's the funny thing. As soon as Nabonidus came to the throne, he didn't like it. He didn't like ruling. And he thought, well, honestly, I thought it was going to be fun. And it's not fun at all. He said, I'd rather get on with my hobby. His hobby was archaeology. So he thought, I'd rather get on and, and study archaeology. So he thought, well, I'll tell you what, I'm not living in Babylon. This is a modern city. I don't want to live there. I'm going to move out to a health resort. So out he went to uh, a place called Tema, T-E-M-A, in Arabia, and he left his son in charge. This is Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. And at this point, you'll catch up with me again. At this point, you get a man whose name you know. N Nabonidus' son, Belshazzar. B E L S H. A double Z A R. Bel Shazar. And so, would you now turn with me to Daniel chapter 5? Well, well, well. We've got there. You'll have to play the tape afterwards very slowly and get it. But we're still only with Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, which is very interesting, just as Jeremiah had prophesied, incidentally. <clears throat> and here you get it in Daniel chapter 5. And at this time, Daniel chapter 5, you've got a feast going on inside Babylon. Cyrus, who Isaiah prophesied about, is now ready to conquer the whole world. But Belshazzar, who is the second, he's co-regent, his father's off away studying archaeology, and he's in charge. He's enjoying himself. Shut up inside uh, Babylon. Cyrus is outside the gate, so he's having a party. It's his God's birthday. So it's nice to have a party, he thought. So he does. And look what it says. Daniel 5, verse 1. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines, drank in them. Now that, believe it or not, was blasphemous. You see, Nebuchadnezzar had taken over the temple in Jerusalem and he'd removed all of the vessels out of the temple. Now, remember what these vessels used to contain. They used to contain the blood of the Lord Jesus in picture form. And the priests used to carry them, oh, so gingerly, to take away the sins of the people. 
And all of a sudden, Belshazzar's enjoying himself, having a great feast to his god. He thinks, this would be marvellous. Let's get those uh, holy things in from Jerusalem, shall we? And he starts pouring wine into them and starts drinking. Now, his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, was a believer. His mother was probably also a believer at this point. And here he is deliberately using the vessels dedicated to the Lord Jesus in his idolatrous feast. Most terrible, terrible time. And finally God says, enough is enough. At this point, Babylon is going to fall. And you see what it says, verse 4, They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood and of stone. And verse 5 then, In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. In the ancient world, inside of the palaces, they always used to write all their great things that they'd done, all their great conquests, in plaster on the wall. And all round the palace, inside, all the great events, I conquered this city, I took over this city, I did this, I did that, and the candlestick was always stood by the, the latest exploit. So that everyone would say, oh, I wonder what he's been up to now. And they go to the wall and say, well, 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 look at this. And they'd read it out. And the candlestick, therefore, was against the wall that had just been written on, but next door was a blank wall of plaster. That was what was about to happen. And all of a sudden, the finger of a man's hand appears from nowhere. And it's God telling the king of Babylon what's going to happen next. And in the plaster, he starts writing. God starts writing certain words. And all of a sudden, the king looks around, he sees it, he drops the wine, he says, what's this? What's going to happen next? And there are certain words written on the wall. Just four words are written. He can't understand them. Many, many, tekel in, can't understand them. What's it mean? Calls the queen in. She's a believer. Hey! And calls the, she won't have anything to do with the feast. Calls her in. Says, hey, what's this mean on the wall? It's terrible. The most awful thing's happened. She said, well, I don't know, she says, but there's a wonderful man of God who can tell you. His name's Daniel. Please bring him in. And Belshazzar, sitting there, biting his nails, says, OK, go and find him, wherever he is. I don't care who he is, he'll be third in the kingdom. Isn't that wonderful that the Bible says he's going to be third in the kingdom? Nabonidus was top, Belshazzar was second, he was going to be third in the kingdom. The Bible is so accurate, you see. Do you know, for years they thought the Bible had got it wrong at this point, until we found out a bit of Babylonian history, and the Bible was right yet again. Turn to the end of Daniel chapter 5. And verse 25, and let's just see this. All right, verse 25. And this is the writing that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Aparsin. This is the interpretation, says Daniel, of what it means. Mene, which is, by the way, the past tense of the verb to number. Numbered, he says. And it's repeated. You've been numbered, you've been numbered. Your days are up, in other words, he says. You know the next thing that's happening to you? You're finished. That's the next thing, next thing that's happened. Right. Mene, mene. God has numbered thy kingdom, and he's finished it tonight. Finished it tonight? Belshazzar must have said, well, I know the Medes and the Persians are outside the door, but look, we're all walled in. How can they get in? Of course they can't get in. What do you mean finished tonight? Ridiculous. Verse 27. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances. And thou found wanting. The word tekel means to weigh something. Weighed in the balances. You're found wanting. Uh, verse 28. Aparsin means and up. Parsin is the word for uh, Persians, which is very interesting. The Persians are going to do it. And Perez here, thy kingdom is divided. And it means to divide. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And Belshazzar is so impressed with this interpretation, so scared, that he finally says to Daniel, OK, Daniel, thanks very much, you've done that, here's your payment. And that's what it says, verse 29, Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And do you notice the next verse? Verse 30, In that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain, and Darius the Median, king of the Medes, took the kingdom, being about 62 years old. 
And at that point, we're going to end for the evening with the Babylonians dwelling securely within the walls, with Cyrus the Persian outside the gates, and next time we're going to see how without an arrow being fired, the Persians were able to walk right into the center of Babylon and take it over. Amen and good night.